Hello and welcome again to The Extra Point. I am Kendall Gammon. Today I am joined by my former teammate, Will Shields, NFL Hall of Famer and several other Hall of Famers that we will uh, talk about today. First off, Will, I appreciate you joining me. No problem. Thanks for having me. Well, we're on location at your uh, workout facility, 68 Inside Sports. That's something uh, that we'll dive into in a little bit, all, in a little bit also. But just in general, um, you and I spent six or seven years together with the, with the, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs. We, we left the same year in 2006. You were wildly successful. I mean, you, I forget whether it's a second or a third round pick out of Nebraska. Third round. Okay, third round. Yep. I, 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 and you, you come to the Chiefs and you play 14 years, 224 games. You start 223. Folks, if you don't know, that is unbelievable. Um, growing up, was that your dream? What was your mindset growing up? And at what point did you start to entertain uh, some of the things that we just talked about? Well, you know, I always loved the game of football. Uh -huh. Even when I was little, I was a kid that basically, I think I went from diapers to, you know, learning how to play the game. Um, I, I call it dump truck. I learned to play the game by actually have, I used to have this toy dump truck, Ooh, right? Okay. And I used to go and I used to run behind it under the tables and all of that and run about, and, and so it kept me low. And so I was sort of like, you know, I'm sort of built for staying low and being behind wow. things and everything else. And, um, but I always loved the game and my brother actually introduced me to the game. Mm -hmm. um, we used to, of course, play, you know, kill the man with the ball, tackle each other, throw it up, yes. run as many ways, you get hit, that kind of thing. And um, just love the game. And it started when I was young and I just had an addiction for it from that point forward. Never really saw myself as a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. um, but in high school, I did get to that point where I did sort of get that feeling of, okay, where are you going to be in four years? Where are you going to be in five years? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh yeah, I never thought about it. And I went back and looked in my lower book, you know, that old lower book you had. Yeah. And it said, where would you be from five years from now? And actually it says playing professional football. So and, you actually, uh, I want to get this. So you actually wrote that down. I actually had wrote it down. Okay, now that is, that and, is great when you talk was, about goal setting. And it was <clears> the <throat> weirdest thing ever because it's one of those things, oh, yeah, I never thought about it. And then <clears> I found <throat> it. My mom goes, hey, check your book out. And it's actually written in there. Um, but then just, you know, when the opportunities came, it was one of those things that was unique because I was on a unique high school football team. Mm -hmm. um, out of our high school, we have 21 professional athletes that came out of that era, right in that era. Wow. Um, between basketball, because basketball, baseball, mm -hmm. and football, between those three sports, we had so many athletes. Was that, this Cameron? Oh, uh, no, this is actually Lawton. Well, oh, we I mean, call, I meant yeah, Lawton. Lawton. Yeah, Cameron Lawton. is the college. Cameron is the played. college. But Lawton, Oklahoma, Yeah, right? Lawton, Oklahoma. So, you know, we were have, you know, we have Lawton High, which is the original, which is us. Right. And then we have Lawton Eisenhower and Lawton MacArthur. Wow. And so we have three high schools. And within those three high schools, man, it was just unbelievable what, talent came out of there. So when I am actually going through school, mm -hmm. I'm looking at other guys. I got, you know, a guy that's, you know, James Trapp, that's one of the fastest guys in the world, Yeah, which we didn't even think about because I was wow. watching James Trapp and Jason Rouser, which are two guys that were running the 400 against one another every week and the 200, and they're running 21 flats in high school. Un unreal. And then our, you know, and our tailback, and he was 250, and he ran a, a, a 10 flat 100. So I'm watching these guys thinking, ah, this is normal. This is what right. you're used you don't, to. Yeah, you don't know any different. You don't know any different. You don't different. know what you don't know. Yeah, and so then you're going, oh, these guys are getting recruited. They're mm -hmm. everything else. And you're going, well, I'm just, you know, that lineman. I'm part of the team. I'm part of right. the group. I'm part of the and, – and so then you just sort of get used to playing against these guys and being, you know, mm -hmm. performing with it. Wow. And most people I even talked to in high school, they were going, well, you know, you were a good football player, but we never saw you as – going to the next level or what you were going to do from that point forward. Right. And that was because there were so many other gifted, talented athletes around you that it just sort of made you elevate your game. Wow. Okay. So I do want to get to your next level here in a second, but before I get there, I just want to talk a little bit. Of, I think something that not a lot of people know about you is, I mean, you're a phenomenal dancer. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I've seen it and you were a singer as well, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's interesting to bring to light to, to folks that, oh, okay, you know, you just think this guy who, who had all these accomplishments in the football, that's all he did. He's got the blinders on and that's all he did. And it was anything but that, wasn't it? Well, I was sort of that hybrid guy. Mm -hmm. um, actually, say I'm the nerd guy of everybody in the bunch. I like technology. I like gadgets. That's why you and I got along in the locker room. Exactly. We talked about that it was all like, the time. Oh, what's the new thing you found or what you yes. look at? 
but also I, I love vocal music. I love drama. I love doing that. I love being a part of it. Mm -hmm. And it was unique, I guess, at that point, because right. there wasn't a lot of athletes that were actually going and saying, okay, I've got 10 hours of stage production drama, you know, mm -hmm. to work on, to take, you know, cause we used to actually travel. And so we used to do show choir and jazz choir. And so we would Very travel cool. and everything else. And I would take a solo to state every year and, you know, wow. get measured. Um, but, you know, like anything else, you wanted to be the best you could be. And, and at that point, you know, everybody wanted to be the next Michael Jackson. They always wanted to be the next person. Right. So the only way to get there is to show if you can do it or not. Wow. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, I'm going to be begging to try to get some of those um, <laughs> tapes of, of you and the solos or whatever. That would be great. Uh, just for... What it's worth for me, I was I was in the spring musicals in high school all four years, so we okay. kind of had a similar there. So yeah. okay, let's get back to the story. You're in high school, you're around everybody, you get to it. You're 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 clearly being recruited. I mean, if you got to this level, you were recruited heavily out of high school, Lawton, Oklahoma. Yeah. You went to Nebraska. Yeah. How yeah. did that go over? It went pretty well. I mean, I was the first. I'm actually the first to leave Oklahoma and step on campus and play. Wow. In history. Um, there was the there was another guy that had actually committed to Oklahoma, but he ended up getting sick and ill and he actually passed before he could actually make wow. the transition from Oklahoma to Nebraska. And so um, I just, you know, we went to camps. We did some camps and clinics, uh -huh. that kind of stuff. And all the guys there was getting recruited. We didn't get our recruiting letters till after we won state. So our coaches held all of our letters and said, hey, I don't want you worried about the next level really? okay. and all of everything else. Right. And so he actually, they actually gave us our letters and we had our recruiting that was going on. And, you know, I had, you know, four or five schools that were close mm -hmm. that I wanted to go to, but camps made a big difference. So I went to OU's camp, I went to Nebraska's camp, I went to Oklahoma State's camp. And, you know, those teams that were recruiting me, it just felt like home. I mean, it was right. when you got there and you were on campus and you're walking around and it, it just felt comfortable to me. It felt like where I could thrive and get to where I wanted to go. Plus, on the other hand, because of academics, I needed to get that academic help. I right. wanted to make sure I had academic help across the boards. And out of all those schools, they had the best academic program set up. Interesting. They already had a computer lab. You know, we're talking in the 90s. Yeah, then, that you was, know. So you know, that was, was the big edge. thing. You know, yeah. everybody now, they go, oh, I got a computer on my phone. It's no big deal. But they had a computer lab. They had study hall. They had it all set up to where I knew I could get the best support so that when I didn't get in school, I could make sure I got my degree. Wow, but th there, was, there was no hard feelings from Oklahoma in general, the fact that you went to somewhat of a rival in the Big Eight in the Nebraska, or was there a little bit? There wasn't because the simple fact of it is I wasn't the top recruit okay. out of our guys. Gotcha, okay. Um, so our top recruit was our running back, Dewell Brewer. He was okay. our running back and he was, man, that dude, that's the guy that could run a 10 flat 100 at 250. What? I mean, he could flat wow. out fly. Mm -hmm. And so um, he was the guy that they were really pushing to get to go to OU. Right, right. And he ended up going to OU. And um, so at that class, I mean, we had two guys go to Clemson, I went to Nebraska, went to OU, and then even our seniors got picked up and went to different places. Wow. But um, he, that was the golden guy at that point that they tried to make sure they had. Um, it was more or less of, oh, yeah, we want you to come, but we're, you know, you're an Oklahoma kid, so you're naturally going to go to Oklahoma. But most people didn't realize my family's from Texas. So okay. we didn't watch, I didn't watch college football at all. Wow. I watched pro football. So I watched the Dallas Cowboys and, mm -hmm. and watched all those teams. So I emulated those guys. I never knew the rivalry between Nebraska and Oklahoma. Interesting, yeah. I never, you know, was stuck on that because I never thought about college. I always just wow. looked at pros and say, hey, you know, my parents looked at pros. So I just saw, hey, that's the goal. That's where you are. That's what happened. Didn't know how to get there. Very nice. I just saw that, yeah. you know, that, hey, you know, yeah, we're sort of a Dallas fan at a while there. You know, uh -huh. watch Pittsburgh and emulate some of those guys. But, you know, so it didn't it didn't affect my family wise as far as where I went to school. They were just looking like you got an opportunity to get a scholarship and right. And right. And, and, to, and to do something that none of us have done. Uh huh. You know, pick the best one that fits for you. Wow. OK, so fast forward uh, draft day. Your, your name is called by the Kansas City. Chiefs, you're a third round pick. Would that have been 93? Yeah, 93. 93 yeah. yeah, and um, you come to the Chiefs. What was the thought of a young kid who had just been uh, at a very big program in Nebraska? I mean, what was the, the, the mindset, your thought process going on now? First and foremost, I was angry. I wondered if because you didn't like you. you, you I, I'm glad we're getting into this. I was an angry man, and I was, and it wasn't angry at people, things, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. 
it was angry because I felt that I, you know, like everybody else, I'm a first round draft pick kind of guy. Right. You know, I think I've proven myself. I won the Outland Trophy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're talented as one of the best linemen. Yes. Um, and yet you're the 11th or 12th guy taken in the draft, you know, mm -hmm. behind other guards, behind other, you know, you don't mind tackles because, you know, that's the different position, different right, thing. Right, right. But you think, yeah, yeah, I can slip in there. I, could, I can play with those guys. I can, you know, I've seen the talent, that kind of thing. And so uh, my agent, Kevin Warren, which was actually from here, which he's now the head of the Big Ten. Oh, wow. Um, okay. he, uh, he goes, hey, Will, don't worry about it. You know, Kansas needs a guard. They're going to they're gonna pick you. You know, they could, they could pick you up here in the third round. You'll be just fine. They need a guard because the guy that was there just got hurt. That was mm -hmm. when uh, Baldy had just hurt his, had okay. hurt his arm. And yeah. they are bringing in. Uh, was that Rich Baldinger or yeah. Brian? Uh, Rich. Rich. Rich they are okay. bringing Rich had just yeah. got hurt. And they mm -hmm. brought in uh, Sevilla. Oh. Danny mm -hmm. to come in and play that spot. He goes, Hey, you got a chance. And it was really interesting because that was really the only team that ever gave me an interview. Wow. You know, that was the only coach I met and gave an interview to and got to talk to the rest That's of the amazing. teams. I didn't get to talk to at all. And, uh, but the old line coach, I didn't talk to at all. And so he was brand new and that was Alex Gibbs. That was, Oh, okay. How, yeah. So when did Solari come in? Solari came in after, um, Art Shell. After Art Shell. Yeah, after oh, wow. Art Shell. Yeah. I did not know you, you were coached by Art Shell. Yeah, also. I was coached by Art Shell. So I had Alex. Those are some, I mean, if you, if you don't know folks, those are some names. Those are some really good offensive line coaches. Oh, you, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I imagine you're pretty appreciative of that. We'll get to that in a little bit. But those were some guys you're very fortunate to be uh, coached oh, by them, it, right? It was so, I was in the right place at the right time. Um, you know, I got picked up and I was, I was sitting here. I was like, okay, I want to prove myself. And then when I first got in my first training camp, mini camp, I was like, wow. These guys are quick. These it guys is a, are fast. It is a These shock. guys are, you know, and not uh -huh. let alone that you walk in the locker room and you got right. Joe Montana, Marcus Allen, guys that you know you're playing video games with that you're going, oh right. man, I'm actually on the same team with them. I get mm -hmm. an opportunity to play, you know, beside them or what have you. And you have that awe moment for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then you have your first terrible training camp, mini camp, and you wake up and you go, oh yeah, there's a lot of things you got to work, work on. on. Wow. There's a lot of things you got to do. And so my first training camp was terrible. And, um, it was really, really eye-opening, and I had Alex, and Alex actually called me after the draft and told me, I don't know why they drafted you. You're from Nebraska. We don't, we don't have Nebraska linemen that are any good, and I don't know why they drafted you. And he wow. was, But Alex is one of those guys. He's straight with you, and that's mm -hmm. what you love about him and right. also what you hate about him. Yep. Because when you're messing up, he's going to tell you you're messing up. Yep. He's like, I don't care what you do. You can yell and scream and whatever. You just don't put your hands on me. He goes, I don't care what you do. Yell and scream and tell me you can, you can yell at this. And he's like, mm -hmm. but just don't put your hands on me. He goes, and I'm going to tell you what I feel, right wow. or wrong or indifference. And, and he goes, look, I don't know if you can play here because I can't see what you can do. So the second training camp, they actually had me rushing the passer because I played defense no. all the way through high school. No way. Yeah, so all the way through high school, I was actually wow. a defensive lineman. And <laughs> I, did def I played both, mm -hmm. but I was defensive lineman basically of the year in Oklahoma and decided that – and I played offense, but I wanted to play offense more than defense at mm -hmm. that point. So I ended up going, I could have went to Arkansas and played defense, but they right. wanted me to lose weight. Now, you know no, how that works. No, can't help you. You know, that. I love my food too much. So <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm not going to lose that weight to go and play DN wow. or D tackle. And I was like, I'd go to Nebraska and be an offensive lineman. And I know they beef you up and get you bigger and they like you bigger and stronger and that kind of stuff. Wow. Okay. So we're going to come back to that again in a minute, but I, I just want to, jump fast forward 14 years, you, yeah. you retire. I mentioned it earlier, but 220, was it 223? 223 or 224. Yeah. So you had 223 starts yeah. out of 224 games. Yeah. You never missed a game. Yeah. Uh, folks, that is unreal. It, it does not happen. I remember for me, I was a line, you know, I was a backup lineman and I was a long snapper. I played 218 games straight before I got hurt and then kept playing. I remember that was very disappointed because I took so much pride in the fact that um, what I did was important. You didn't always notice it, but the fact is I was always available. I was always there. And you know, actually, uh, I, I remember, you know, that game that I played half of it, you know, when I broke my leg, I'm not bright enough to know it's broke. And you're, you're, you're just like, you know, just stay down. We'll, we'll block for you. You just snap the ball and stay down. You're trying to watch out for me, which is cool, but it, it, it hurt me. But I know that's one thing that you really took a lot of pride in because those 223 games, it's not like you were healthy every game. Yeah. 
you were just available and you played. And you played at a high level because I think it was a seven Pro Bowls, three uh, All Pros. I could be wrong on the Pro. I know it was 12 Pro Bowls, yeah. three uh, first team All Pros. It goes on and on and on. Just talk to me about that mindset that you had and, and, and maybe what people would like to hear about how you conditioned your mind to do those things. Well, once I got a chance and I was sitting here going, I got drafted in the third round, okay, I get an opportunity. Um, my mentality sort of changed as I wanted to make the other 31 teams pay for not drafting me. So right. that was sort of my mentality of every time you play me, you're gonna have to prepare for me, you're gonna have to know, I'm gonna do something to make a difference in the game. Wow. Um, because you, you passed on me, you mm -hmm. didn't give me my opportunity. And so I sort of took that as a mindset. And then, you know, then I learned little things as I start going through of, you know, I said, uh, well, how do you win one-on-ones, one-on-one pass protections and that kind of stuff. And they go, look, it's not for offensive linemen to win that, it's for you to negotiate space with that. And I said, no, I want to win them. So then you take the mindset of, I want to win 90% of my one-on-ones. And then you want to take it to where I don't want them to get two yards penetration on one on one. Wow. Okay. Then I want to take it on this day. I'm going to work on right hand punches only this hand, left hand punches only. The next day I'm working on this footwork. The next day I'm working on that footwork. And so I took it and took the game and sort of sliced it up into little pieces. OK, so that I'm always working to get better. And I think that's what made the difference in my mentality of what I wanted to do as far as being, you know, a good player, you know, and, and I sort of right. take that mentality of, uh, you know, if you strive for perfection, you'll equal, you'll equal excellence at least. Wow. And so, know. so I think what I hear you saying is, is, is you cut things up in little chunks and yeah. you get it one bite at a time yeah. then you slowly put it all together. I think it's interesting you talk about that because I know you can remember this because you were doing the same thing, but you know, one of our other teammates, a hall of famer, Tony Gonzalez, you always saw him working on different things before practice, after practice, mm -hmm. you're the same way. I remember how you were working on your shuffles back and forth and your hand punches and whatever. I, I think that's very unique, unique. And maybe uh, sometimes I think people, they, they look at the big picture and it overwhelms them too much. Would you agree? I do. And, and I think most people don't realize that, Hey, every little thing, something's not going to happen. Right. Right. The question is, what do you do after it happens? How do you recover? How do you, how do you, you know, we used to block people backwards half the time. You get spun around, you're back, right. facing the other way and you're going, okay, I hope he throws the ball before the quarterback gets hit or I hope he makes me look better. And that's the whole part about the game. It's not meant to be perfect because the person on the other side gets paid to play. They, right. you know, their job is to disrupt you and yours is to, to, to win and every little bit wins and it's not going to be perfect. And, and I think once you realize that, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get out of trouble? Right. And if you can figure those things out, it makes your life a whole much easier instead of going, I got to be in the perfect stance, the perfect place in the perfect hands. Right. And a lot of guys that played the game or coaches the game don't understand that. Right. They think I can coach everybody the same and they're going to do the same as that guy that really can do it well, but they don't understand that guy that does it really well. He's figured it out for himself before you figured it out. So I can't right. make you emulate what you used to do and snap the ball. Right. And I used to watch you snap and I'm like, oh yeah, look, he's how many yards are you? 10. Yeah. And he would, you would have it laces out 10 and mm -hmm. everything else. And I was like, I can't do that. Right. You know, but you've perfected it because you've done it over and over exactly and over right. and yep. mentally you've got it broken down mm -hmm. where right. that's the whole point. And once you get somebody to break it down mentally, they'll love the game. Because it's fun. And that's the fun part of, for me is figuring out how many different ways I can manipulate that person. Wow. Very nice. That, that's interesting to hear. I think that's something that people uh, are really going to like to kind of kind of cut up a little bit and, and want to go back and, and, and listen to again because I think that's so important. So, okay, so now we've come to a part in, in the show I call the power of gratitude. You know, in mm -hmm. general, I think gratitude, being thankful, is one of the rawest, realest emotions we can have in life and mm -hmm. so very important. Will, when I ask you, what does gratitude mean to you? What, what are some, maybe some folks or some events in your life that, that you're thankful for that you could talk about? Well, you know, there's there's so many different things that you can be gratitude, you know, grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful where I grew up. The simple fact of it is, is that, you know, I call it, I have a bunch of moms and dads that helped cultivate what it is. My, right. Of course, my parents were the catalyst of everything, mm -hmm. but I had those outside of that household that, kept you together and showed you how to be a better person. Um, you know, I have the, in college, I have Coach Osborne and that staff that actually groomed the, 
the philanthropy side of me of, hey, the giving, you can do things even if you are not the premier guy on the team. You're not the person that stand out in front of everyone else. Um, you, know, you're, you know, you're a guy that can make differences. And, you know, whatever you do, do the best of it is and make it better than where you were when you, when you, when you got there. Um, and gratitude for my family, for, for them putting up and supporting me when, right. when you come home and you're grumpy and you don't want to talk and, you know, and, and, you know, that wife of yours is going, okay, he's in that kind of mood. Come on, family. We're good. I got you. Right. We're good. You know, um, and being understanding because to be a professional athlete, you have to be selfish. And that's the hard part about it. You're selfish sometimes because you've got to go work out two and three times. Right. You've got to go do the extra things to make sure that you are doing what you want to do. And, you know, thanks for, for the opportunity to play this sport for a living for, for as long as I did because it changed, it changed the, uh, the path of my family. Right. That, you know, nothing else would have ever done to this degree to where now I can change the path of other people's family. Wow, and that's, that's the coolest thing ever. Yeah, that's beautiful. <clears throat> so let's let's expand on your family a little bit. Senya is from Denmark. She yes. played soccer at at, uh, at Nebraska, Nebraska, right? Yep, she played soccer there. <clears throat> it was the pickup team. We call it the pickup okay. team. It wasn't official, but they actually played right when they were starting to begin soccer programs. Okay. And so KU, I think KU and a couple of other teams had official soccer mm -hmm. teams at that point. Other women's teams didn't. Nebraska didn't. So they had girls that actually got together that played in high school and college or high school that right. played in college and would go play the other teams. Wow. And so she played on that team at Nebraska. Very nice. Um, yeah, Danish, which is really cool because that expands my, expanded my mindset mm -hmm. because I was so Midwest stuck. Yeah. And, you know, the first day she goes, hey, you know, you want to come home with me and meet the family? And I'm like, what do you mean home? Yeah. You know, <laughs> where's home for you? And, and she had a phone call with her mom mm -hmm. and they're talking Danish. And, oh, wow. and you're listening to a new language that's different. You know, you think Spanish is different and everything yeah. else, but you hear a whole nother language. You're going, whoa, wait a minute. Where'd this come from? This is. Wow. So it broadened your horizon. Yes. And she's that person that's pulled it out of us of, OK, we're going to travel home where we're going to go. And we're going to go to Spain before we go visit mom and dad and grandma and all of them in other countries. Cool. So it broadened our kids horizon too, mm -hmm. of them looking at the world differently because right. when you go somewhere else and you see what they go through mm -hmm. compared to what you have here, right. hopefully yes. you feel more <clears throat> spoiled yes. of yeah. what we have here. Right. I mean, for the first you know, eight summers, we'd go home because I go home every other summer mm -hmm. and I train over there. But when, when you go home, you know, they don't have air conditioning. Right. For the hot days. It's like, you know, but they do think, you know, 90 degrees is hot, you know, which is different in our mindset. I'm thinking it's a great day. I'm out here running sprints mm -hmm. and doing all this other stuff. I'm like, it's so hot here. And I'm like, it's 90 degrees. This is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. it's right, beautiful. Right. So that's the difference of the mentality and learning right. the different culture piece. Which is all a mindset. What, it's, it's basically what you decide to label something. Is that exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. And your yeah. experiences and what you learn from mm -hmm. those experiences helps you grow. And wow. that's the coolest thing ever, because now you look at things differently. Um, I'm one of those guys that look from the outside in, not the inside out. And that's, right. and that's the hard part for most people to understand. Yep. And they're going, well, how do you not get mad about that? I was like, well, I've seen worse and I've been through worse. I've right. seen other people that have it worse. Mm -hmm. So this is nothing. This is just a bump in the road that we'll work our way around through or, or you know, or, or build another bridge around it. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you talked about your, your family. We, we, we talked about Senya, but yeah. um, Siobhan, your oldest boy, then you've got uh, Sonika. Yeah. And Sin then I have to go Sonika first because oh, Sonika first. Sonika is the oldest. You oh, know, she's, she's the oldest. Then Siobhan. She's the oldest of the I, bunch. I apologize. Oh. No, 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 I know better. No problem. You I know, know them she, all. And then Solomon too. She gets too. very, sis, you know, hey, I'm the oldest. You know, you give me my, <laughs> my just due, even though I'm the girl of the family. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, so Sonika is actually in med school right now. She played at Drury, graduated uh -huh. from Drury, and then decided I'm going to go to med school. So she's finishing her third year mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. She's doing residency and those kind of things. She's doing an excellent job. And then I have Siobhan um, that actually graduated in Nebraska, played basketball there, and now he's playing overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been traveling over there for the last few years. And then uh, Solomon just graduated, actually finished his last class a couple of days ago. Oh, so nice. he'll have his degree, and, and we'll see what's next for him. And he does, you know, film and, 
and all the art stuff. So I, I got a little bit of everybody. I got an right. athlete, I've got the brainiac, and then I've got the I know uh, you the love the film student. stuff though. I know you're, you're into that for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like, sure. I like watching him and seeing what he's creating and yeah. everything else. I know he's going, dad, are you critiquing me again today? And I'm like, yeah, but I do it on the low. I don't, I don't give him all, you know? You know, it's, it's got great memories. The, the, the year that I went to the, the Pro Bowl was 2005. I remember, you know, I was around, we were around each other's families and that's just really cool. You know, it was always neat to me and the fact that my boys, they, well, the first thing I was going to bring up is it's neat that we had long enough careers that our, our kids can remember us playing and they can, you know, they, they went to the Pro Bowls with us or they came out onto the field after a game. I, I think that's such a special thing. It is. And I, and I talk to guys all the time with doing the legend stuff. Mm -hmm. I talk to guys all the time and they're going, hey, how do I get filmed? Because now I finally have kids. And my, they want to see it. And yeah. my kids don't believe I played, that I was really an athlete, yeah. that I was a baller, and I was this, that, yep. and the other. And I, and I go, I go, you know, so I set them up with how they can get that done. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of those things that even like my youngest, he was so young when, he, when we were going through it, mm -hmm. he'll go back and watch video and watch films, and he'll go back and go, oh, I I sort of remember, but I don't because he was still sort of young. Right he at was, that age. Uh -huh. You know, he was at that age where he was at the game, mm -hmm. but – you know, he's more worried about, hey, am I going to get this snack or I'm going to get this, right, get that, right. than worry about the game. So now it's pretty cool for him to, you know, go back and watch games. And he was like, oh, yeah, I forgot you guys were seven and four that year and wow. that kind of stuff. And yep. it's funny because that's what he'll bring up of certain years and certain things that happened. Wow. Okay, so uh, we've got another segment we're going to go into, and this is called Make a Difference. So this one, Make a Difference. It's my mantra, no matter what you do with yourself, with others, you just try to make a positive difference in some way. You did that in the NFL at the highest level. You were the Walter Payton Man of the Year, I think 2003? 2003. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't know, that is the award in the NFL. I mean, of, of, of anything, it is the award to get. And um, you have uh, a foundation, the Will to Succeed Foundation. Yeah. And I remember my seven years as a teammate of uh, uh, yours, uh, attending so many different events that you had going on. Just talk ab about that, make a difference, and, and how important that is. Well, you know, I think it started when I was in high school. Um, that was sort of our mindset. We had this uh, Sioux word that we used, and it's called Hantayo. Um, and it was a Sioux word because we grew up in Oklahoma. We knew reservations better than we knew states. Wow. So we basically learned the reservations of what Indian tribe was where and, mm -hmm. you know, Choctaw, Cherokee Creek. We used to go through it and um, we used to use a Sioux word named Hantio. Uh, and actually, uh, one of our quarterbacks used to wear it at OU around on his uh, on his. Uh, he had a bandana, oh, okay. but he wear it around his neck and Hantio for us means clear the way. And wow. so basically it's a Sioux word for clear the way. And so that's what we always use as our mantra is for us to clear the way for the next group, the next person coming through. Uh, it's not about what we do or what we have accomplished. It's about wow. clearing the way for who's next and whatever. And so I sort of use that as my mantra also. Mm -hmm. And I actually added two pieces to it because in Nebraska we had a uh, poem or a prayer we used to say that a guy brought from uh, St. Louis. And at the end, it says day by day, we get better and better. The team that can't be beat won't be beat. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I take the day by day, we clear the way and I've add those together. And that's what I use as my daily mantra. Wow. Wow. I really like that. Is, is that something that you consciously say internally yeah. on a daily basis? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Anytime you want to refocus and re mm -hmm. re understand where you want to be. Right. Um, you know, you have to look at and use the word haunt yo to sort of refocus yourself. And I don't know if you ever heard that before. People usually say you have power words and power colors and power yeah. things that you can do. And you have to choose that word that has the most meaning to you and utilize it when you feel like you're losing your way or not focused or not doing what you need to do on that day. And you sort of go back to that power word and that power word helps you refocus yourself. Wow. I think that's important for people to hear also that you as a Hall of Famer, a college Hall of Famer in the Chiefs Hall of Fame, the NFL Hall of Fame, everything you've you've done, that it's not always perfect, that, that sometimes you do have to refocus and you do have to reset. Oh, you do. You always get sidetracked. I mean, especially in this day and age, there's so many different things that you can get sidetracked on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you just try to, you know, hey, how do I keep myself on path right. of where I want to be, where I want to go, how I want to get there? And then how do I set that next goal? Wow. Uh, and that's the hard part. You know, where do you set that next goal to? What do you want to do next? And, and you know, you got to have that, we call it that daily life inspiration of, you know, the why. Yeah. 
you know, why do I exist? Why, why mm -hmm. am I here? Um, actually, I heard a great guest speaker that went through and he goes, we were, we were not all born ordinary. And most people don't think about that. Everybody just goes, well, I'm just an ordinary guy. No, you weren't born ordinary because you were born. Right. There's a lot of us not born. There's a lot of us that don't make it. There's a lot of us wow. out there. So there's a day, there's a reason, mm -hmm. there's a purpose. You just got to understand what that purpose is. Okay, so with that purpose, and we were talking about making a difference, uh, I, I want to go into Operation Breakthrough a little mm -hmm. bit because I think this is one of the most phenomenal programs that I've been around. Can you just kind of tell folks a little bit more about that? Operation Breakthrough is the largest child care center in the Kansas City, Missouri area. And basically they have been, it started by two nuns that actually took over an old J.C. Penney building and they started a, ch a child care center. They basically right now host 750 kids on a daily basis. That means breakfast for some kids before they go to school. And then they actually bring kids in and take care of them during the day. And then now we're able to see kids all the way up through high school. Um, over the last three or two and a half, three years, we've mm -hmm. expanded. And I right. say, you say sort of say we, because I've been a part of it since, yeah. since the beginning. Um, you know, my teammates actually helped us raise enough money that right when I was going to retire, we ended up being able to purchase the building that they were in. And so we ended up paying that off during one of our events. And then from that point, over the last year and a half, um, we were part of the board that actually just raised $17 million to create the second tier of the building, which goes across the street, that now actually houses all the way up through high school. And within that, there's a job core program. And now actually we've been able to pass it along to the new current chiefs and Kelsey and those guys have do volunteer dollars and everything else. And now we're gonna build a new lab on the backside that helps people with engineering and also with automotive and everything else. So uh, it's gonna turn into one of the hubs of that area that will create a change. I, I love that because you, you have touched so many people and by touching me as a teammate and other teammates that allowed us to come in and, and help in some fashion as well. You know, what made it cool is that every time I called on my teammates, you guys, you came. Yeah. And that, that made life easy. Everybody's like, oh yeah, well, how'd you do this, how'd that? I was like, oh, I got teammates. As, yeah. as long as you got teammates that'll show up, right. it makes life easy because that brings everyone else to the table. Right. Um, and brings other people that basically wouldn't have showed up the first time Yep. because you say, hey, Kendall's going to be there, such and such is going to be there. They know the faces that they're going to see. Mm -hmm. And that made a big difference. That made life so much easier. That's cool. Okay, so we've talked about the Walton Pay Walter Payton Man of the Year, the biggest uh, uh, award you can get uh, on the, on the uh, outside the lines, you yeah. know, not playing football. Yeah. But also in 2015, you're inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. I was fortunate enough to, you were nice enough to invite me and I certainly <laughs> accepted and got there. But you know, you had, I think Casey Wigman came, John yeah. Tate, uh, a few other that, of the linemen came. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of other guys as well. First and foremost, um, when you're up there and you're delivering the speech, um, can you put it into words? And can you put it into words in general, what it means? So this, I mean, cause this is, the ultimate respect. Well, you, you can't, when you're up there, you can't give the love you want to give to every person that's done something in your life. Right. Uh, first and foremost, they give you a time limit. They're supposed, you know, they give yeah. you a time limit. Oh, you don't have this, this much time to talk because right. they're running the show. Mm -hmm. um, and so you only have so much time and so many people and you're, it's hard to pick who's, it's not one person that jumps out unless they've, you know, taken you in when you were a kid, right. they've done something beyond and be, you mm -hmm. know, and there's just so many people to, to celebrate with. And that's why I was, I was happy that we So was it, it overwhelming in a, a, it, in a sense? You know, I, I don't know if it was, it was more overwhelming when it was over because it was such a blur when you're doing it. Gotcha. Because there's so many things. They pull you one way, you're doing this, you're doing mm -hmm. that, you're doing this. You're trying to make sure your sister makes it in, your brother makes it in, right. your, your mom does this, or your dad does this. Or, and so you're just busy, sort of like functioning in an event. You're sort right. of on autopilot, going from here to there, to this, to that, to yeah. this. Then when it's over and done, you sort of look at it and go, wow. Yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 and you walk into the room. I think that the one thing that makes it surreal is when you have the luncheon. So they have a luncheon where it's just a hall of famer. Was oh, that the gold jacket dinner? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually, it's, even... it's actually, uh, they call it, I'm trying to think of his name. 
um, but it's a special luncheon that okay, one gotcha. guy put together. And it's that middle of the day and you're sitting there and you're sitting across from Jim Brown. You're sitting next to, you know, wow. guys that you emulated, you know, guys that you've always wanted to just go, hey, you right. know, can I reach out and touch your arm? Because I wanted to be like you, you know, and, mm -hmm. and when a guy walks up to you, that's an offensive lineman and he goes, you're number three. And you're going, well, what are you talking about? You're the third true guard in the in the Hall of Fame. Wow. Of us. The rest of the guys came from being, you know, tight ends or what have wow. you, or, you know, you're a traditional, you're one, you know, and you're the, you know, and and that changes your mindset of, wow, this is crazy. And you know, you were just thinking, I'm just playing to be the best I can be. I just want to be good for my guys. Right. On the line during those days, yeah. during that time. Mm -hmm. And yet the first time it ever hit me that, you know, it didn't even hit me at that thinking about I could go in was actually Art Shell when he was coaching. He goes, you know, if you keep doing what you're doing, you might be able to put those 10 letters behind your name. Wow. He said, but until you do, until you do that, don't talk trash to me. <laughs> no, because he's that's Art. Art's yeah. like, hey, don't go. Yeah, I'm not going to go right. go upstairs and fight. I'm not going to do that. You do it for yourself. And once you get those 10 letters, then you can do whatever you want to do. And so it was funny because I'm sitting in that room and I walk over to Art and I go, so what does it feel like to be, you know, that I can actually have 10 letters behind my name? Oh, nice. You know, and he was like, yeah, I remember that conversation. That's about having that's the really, 10 letters. That's really, really cool. And so that, that, those are the cool things. And so every year that we get a chance to go back, mm -hmm. I go back. Yeah. I, I don't know why guys wouldn't go back. I can't imagine. Because I get a chance to ask or sit. I sit at a different table, every, different guys every year as much as I can. Mm -hmm. Because I want to sit and listen to them talk. Because they've been there, done it. They, they know the route. They know the routine. Um, so I actually last time sat with Joe Namath. And of course, why wouldn't you just set with Joe Namath? And, and it's that funny. And he, beautiful. Looks, and he looks over at me and goes, how'd you get stuck at our table? I was <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what do you mean stuck? I, I chose to sit. Oh, really? Why would you sit with us? And I was like, hey, I just like sitting back like a fly on the wall and just listening wow. to you guys hang out with each other. Because, you know, he's got a few teammates in there. Yeah. And when they see each other, you know, they're ribbing, they're back and oh, forth. Yeah. And that's the cool part. You know, it's like being back in the locker room. You're sitting there with mm -hmm. locker room with other guys. It's the final ultimate locker room. Yeah. Uh, as far as football goes, that's beautiful. Yeah, you know, one thing that I love is the fact also is, I mean, offensive linemen, even though they're in the Hall of Fame, it's still a little bit of a forgotten position, not as much as long snapping, but uh, still <laughs> a little bit, I, I jest. But I love the fact that at the Pro Bowl, my boys knew enough, even though that you were a, a teammate, that they, they knew that you were special. And like, they wanted to take a picture with you besides taking pictures with Jerome Bettis and some other people like that. I always thought that's cool. I love the fact that I, I know have you those forced pictures. him to do that. I appreciate I did it. Not that force made him me to do feel that. better. I you know that you, I he's not. like, hey man, that guy's a teammate of ours. Can you get? <laughs> no, 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 no. Very, very well aware. But uh, I think it's beautiful. You know, I, I appreciate you sharing with us today, and you know, letting us come down to your beautiful facility. And um, it is called the Extra Point. So, uh, is there one thing that you have in your mind you'd like to talk about, or one thing that you'd like to say a little bit extra about? Well, you know, I think right now with everyone in their mindset of what they're doing, look at all the options, look at all the different things that are out there, um, you know, and I know we've all been taught certain things in certain ways, right? Um, but make sure you go out and weigh everything that goes along with it to make sure you understand the purpose of it, because everything has its specific purpose. And if you don't understand the purpose of it, then you don't understand why it's been put in place. And to me, that makes a big difference. And so I think the other piece of it is, is go out and challenge it. Find out why and find out if it works because we are the ones that are supposed to govern each other and everything else. And we know right from wrong. So how do you go and govern? You gotta know what's going on. It's like, if you think about our ecosystem, we think about the water and the air and everything else. We just expect for somebody else to figure out why it works and how it works and how it puts together. But it's our job to know. And if we don't know, then you can't say yes or no to what it's supposed to be if you don't know how it's supposed to run in the first place. That is beautifully put. That is very eloquently put. I appreciate that very, very much. He is Will Shields, NFL Hall of Famer. I'm Kendall Gammon. This has been The Extra Point. Thanks.